Hey everyone, hi, I'm Alex Williams, founder of the New Stack, and this is the fourth year that we have done the open source program office survey uh, with the Linux Foundation, and we look forward to presenting these results. Hi everyone, Hillary Carter, VP of Research from the Linux Foundation. I, um, I just joined the LF in March, and within a matter of days, I became involved in this project, so I was so excited to have the resources of the new stack to collaborate and uh, uh, bring this project forward on somewhat an urgent and timely basis. And uh, Chris Anizik, um, one of the co-founders of the Todo Group, and kind of helped spearhead a lot of this um, open source program, you know, research, and was very thankful when Hillary came on board to kind of take a fresh, uh, fresh look and, and light, um, you know, at it. So, you know, I think we're going to start uh, a little bit with, you know, Hillary maybe going over some of the methodology, demographics. And so on, and kind of you know the how we kind of thought about and performed the research, and then we'll kind of go highlight some of the you know tr you know trends that we've discovered, and kind of open up with some kind of questions um, you know for the audience because essentially we are between you and Frosty Beverages, um, and so we kind of want to be on time and keep things uh, moving. So feel free to. Take off? Go, okay, yeah. great. So we'll frame our discussion today. We'll uh, briefly uh, discuss the results from the 2021 uh, State of the OSPO survey. Uh, we'll discuss some of the key findings and really we'd like to have an opportunity to answer all your, all your questions. So that's what we're going to get uh, accomplished today. Uh, th thoughts to think about, or discussion points, um, what kind of, you know, what's the level of learning and understanding about um, the value of an OSPO and uh, the um, benefits that OSPOs bring about, uh, what can we do to improve developer experiences, what, uh, how important is culture as uh, one of the value propositions for the OSPO, what are gaps in open source practices, um, uh, what do we do when organizations are not sure where to even begin or have no knowledge about their um, maturity in the process, and uh, these are just some things to think about, and by all means, please bring these questions forward later on in the discussion. And save them for the end. <laughs> Okay, so our methodology, we um, uh, created a survey uh, earlier in the spring and we translated the survey into Chinese and Japanese for the first time uh, in four years, which was great. And we got a good response from um, those uh, language speakers uh, and helped diversify the reach of uh, the survey. And it's a practice that we like to do as often as we can. Because while people may speak English well, um, the ability to answer effectively and capture more accurate data is always uh, made better when you're answering a survey in your native language. So we were really pleased um, to be able to do that. Uh, our respondents to the survey, um, a good chunk are, are developers, 20% um, from IT management, uh, including um, representation from the C-suite, CIO, CTO, and so on. And a good third of uh, the respondents work for large organizations. So June 10th, the survey went into the field and we distributed the survey primarily to email subscribers at Linux Foundation. This went out to about more than a million uh, subscribers and we had an incredibly solid uh, response rate. Uh, we had 1,141 completes and of that data set there was maybe one result that was deemed unacceptable so a very high quality uh, respondent uh, community this is a very engaged space whether they're knowledgeable about OSPOs or not they really took a lot of time and consideration on how they completed the survey very high uh, satisfaction with that uh, data uh, yeah in terms of um, our responses, what, what the survey uh, is telling us is that tech companies uh, represent, um, again, just over a third of our responses, which is slightly lower than in years past, which is actually a healthy signal. Uh, the fact that uh, people are participating in the survey from outside the tech sector uh, speaks to the reach of OSPOs into other industries, um, including Industries like education, financial services, government, and so on. The kind of brick and mortar institutions that are becoming more uh, involved in software and having to confront digital transformation. So that was a really good sign. 
And uh, universities of the education uh, were more than half of those um, who, who indicated that they were from academia. So in terms of organizations, um, where organizations are on their OSPO journey, primarily it is around the consumption of open source. Uh, and that is a finding that's very consistent with other surveys that we've done so far at the LF, certainly in financial services. There's a lot more uh, activity in the OSPO pertaining to consumption than there is around contribution or culture or other aspects of uh, collaboration. While the 2021 data seems to just slightly drop uh, in terms of activity uh, by each of the top variables over the past four years, what we see is an interesting trend at the bottom where those who are n maybe not involved in open source or don't know where their organization is, is actually increasing. And again, that speaks to the fact that open source is reaching new industries and participants are interested enough to answer a survey, but they're not quite sure where their particular institution stands in terms of uh, OSPO maturity. So quite an interesting um, result there. Cool. And uh, I guess we'll hand it over to me to talk a little bit about some of the, you know, I think from our opinion, key findings that we've, you know, uh, distilled uh, from the survey. I mean, there's, there's definitely, you know, a ton of questions that, you know, that were part of the survey, but to kind of make things a little bit easier and fit in the, you know, 20 minutes or so we have um, here, I'll kind of cover it. So, you know, we generally ask folks to kind of, you know, what, what do you think your top OSPO, you know, generally responsibilities, you know, you know, traditionally sometimes, you know, for people it could be compliance, it could be managing culture and, you know, you know, obviously from this kind of list you could see that, you know, culture, you know, made up a huge, um, you know, chunk of, um, you know, OSPO, uh, you know, responsibilities. Compliance, you know, makes a ton of, uh, you know, sense, you know, if, you know, the dominant aspect of, of an OSPO is to assume that you could easily consume open source software, you're going to need to ensure that you're compliant, especially if you're distributing the software, you could definitely run into issues. I think, you know, if you look at back at like kind of the early OSPOs that were created, a lot of them were heavily focused on legal compliance, ensuring all your ducks, you know, on a row to ensure that, you know, you know, we are being good open source uh, consumers um, and so on. Um, you know, uh, there is kind of this you know, trend of people building products and open source and so on. So that's definitely kind of a focus on, you know, understanding, you know, how to, you know, properly use open source in a commercial, um, you know, setting. Um, other kind of interesting, you know, uh, trend that we kind of, you know, see, I think, in the data is this whole notion of uh, tooling for effective open source use. And generally what, you know, for me that, that maps to, you know, essentially something called developer efficiency or developer productivity. You want to make sure that developers could, use and consume open source, you know, uh, you know, take part and, you know, add things to kind of their workflow without kind of going through a laborious, um, you know, process. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm talking to a lot of, you know, companies that are trying to sometimes figure out, you know, you know, should, should my OSPO kind of live, you know, they're creating these new like developer efficiency, you know, teams and like, should my OSPO kind of live there and help out um, there. So, you know, this is, I think, kind of fairly, you know, standard what we've seen, you know, hi historically, you know, uh, to be kind of the, you know, top five, um, you know, OSPO responsibilities, but it tends to be very multifaceted depending on what type of company, you know, you are. If you're just, you know, simply not, you know, shipping, you know, or distributing devices or anything like that, you're going to have different kind of responsibilities for your OSPO than someone that um, is just simply consuming uh, open source software and maybe offering uh, a service and not actually shipping physical devices. Yeah, anywhere. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, so, so why? So you're, why, why, yeah. So, uh, so as I said, business alignment, business goal alignment. Yeah. So I mean, I, I think that given this this survey, like you know, we, you know, it hit a larger audience of different folks. So you know, maybe you know that's why it has not uh, been the dominant thing. We've we, we've hit new languages, new cultures, and kind of new you know, sets of institutions, educational, you know, government. So maybe they have a different philosophy here where, you know, if you're an academic or government, maybe your alignment between what the business wants is not as important. I, I don't really know. Like it, it is something interesting to, um, you know, to, to point out. But, you know, I think this is kind of a, uh, a field that is, you know, evolving, right? You know, you had OSPOs that, you know, had a very specific purpose in the early days for corporate, for corporations and things have kind of evolved now where like there's 
come these companies that are kind of being formed around open source projects. You have academic institutions, you have governments declaring that, you know, in the EU that there'll be OSPOs there. So I think there's just a lot of different, you know, attitudes going on. And we actually may, you know, have to potentially evolve this survey to kind of, you know, uh, cross cut amongst these different concerns. Oh, so. Just upon reflection of past surveys that we've done, we did find that increasingly engineering organizations are leading the OSPOs. And so that may affect in some degree how OSPOs are viewed overall. I think it's something we may want to explore further down the road. So uh, in terms of OSPO, you know, b benefits, uh, it's like, you know, it's a faster time to market. We could reuse stuff cheaper, you know, kind of common things we're all familiar with. Uh, uh, all these kind of were kind of close enough that, you know, there's really no standouts, but, you know, essentially awareness of um, just usage of kind of what we're using in companies uh, is, is a top thing. A lot of times I talk to organizations, especially larger ones, they truly don't know what necessarily they use across an organization, right? Things tend to be siloed, they have duplicate dependency. An OSPO basically acts almost as like a software archeologist to kind of come in and kind of understand like what the hell are we actually using? Are we compliant with all these things? And so that seems gonna be a kind of a, a top benefit that you kind of help someone index, you know, uh, all, all these things. And, um, you know, other thing around culture change, um, you know, especially for you know, uh, sometimes, you know, working in a specific part of the tech industry, you kind of get biased of how, you know, things work. But if you go talk to a traditional institution that's like, you know, transforming to become like a software company, it's a completely type, you know, different type of world. So for them, you know, changing the culture of the organization to kind of be more software, f software first, you know, open source friendly is kind of a big thing because they're just, maybe they're a hardware company or they built, you know, certain, they built cars and they don't get how software works. So I think culture is kind of a big thing that OSPOs are, are, are helping it with one of the benefits. So, you know, if you look kind of, you know, at the data here, who's kind of, who's got an OSPO? You know, I see some people in the room here that are involved in, 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 in OSPOs, but generally, you know, the, the kind of tech and, you know, telco industry communications seem to kind of be the dominant um, players. Financial services, I think, historically, has been to doing a pretty good job. And I think part of that, you know, has been uh, a certain segment of the industry kind of has been early buying into like Linux and open source as a way to kind of innovate uh, against, um, you know, their peers. Public sector is something we're hearing more and more, you know, from there's a lot of interest there. Um, education, which kind of, you know, lumps in, um, you know, academic is, you know, kind of can grow. But, you know, overall, like all this shows to me is, you know, just traditional tech companies are still kind of um, at the forefront, but there's still um, a lot of potential opportunity, um, you know, for, for you know, uh, growth uh, for, for, you know, open source offices across, um, you know, the, the industry. And, you know, when, when I talk to a lot of folks, I try to, you know, always bring up the analogy is like, you know, it, you know it, it, people may not believe this, but, you know, there was no such thing as like a CISO until like 1995, right? Like until something, you know, happened so poorly for, for Citibank that they had to go hire someone to kind of solve this problem. It was kind of a reactive thing. And we're seeing more and more companies becoming proactive about this, understanding that, holy crap, you know, we need to become, you know, more of a software company. We need to know how open source, you know, works because that's the de facto, you know, way software is generally built, um, you know, these days. So um, I expect to kind of see this increase um, over time. And I think part of that is just, you know, having, you know, groups like the Do Group and other groups out there educating um, you know, organizations, companies that this is something they could do, providing playbooks and, and, and resources. Um, so of the people that generally have, um, you know, you know, OSPOs, you know, like how do, they, how do people view um, the, you know, how, how an OSPO is like critically successful to their kind of organization? This actually kind of, you know, rose um, this year, which is kind of good, you know, data. So I think, you know, about 63% you know, of, of folks kind of find their OSPO extremely critical to the success of their product and engineering organizations. And I think, you know, as, you know, this kind of field matures in the industry, I think we'll continue to kind of, um, you know, see this uh, increase, um, you know, over, over time. Um, yeah, another like basic question, has your open source improved the positive impact of your company's software practices? You know, you know, generally kind of like, you know, roughly, you know, the same as last year, maybe a little bit down, but, you know, 77% of organizations basically are like, this has improved how I do development. And a lot of that time could be around things, like I said, just understanding what teams are like building and consuming and sharing that information across um, different teams, um, using more modern, um, you know, different software options. It's just, 
you know, OSPOs generally help organizations improve their collaboration and developer efficiency from, from my um, uh, experience. And I think we, you know, uh, sometimes, um, you know, we had some interesting kind of like quotes and, you know, commentary from folks of kind of like, what has the OSPO kind of done, you know, for you, one of them is like, just streamline, you know, license compliance and, and so on. So, you know, instead of kind of, you know, building stuff your own or forking projects and OSPO kind of helped them, you know, kind of really figure out what they're actually shipping uh, and improve their compliance process. This is kind of like, you know, I think step zero, step one of what generally an OSPO does, uh, you know, for, um, you know, for, for folks. Uh, another thing was around um, code quality. So, you know, you know, OSPOs generally act as bridges between potentially different teams that may not even talk to each other. And so just the kind of impact of creating these kind of, you know, bridges improve you know, documentation and collaboration and just improve the, the quality, um, you know, uh, level overall. Um, another kind of interesting thing is like, you know, everyone's kind of familiar that we're in kind of a once in a generation, I think, recruiting market in the tech industry. And, you know, you know, this kind of quote, you know, came from uh, an organization that, you know, communication has improved. It's kind of helped, uh, we, you know, with re recruiting, you know, a shorter time to market for people to get onboarded uh, in the organization based on, um, you know, the, the help that their OSPO, um, uh, you know, provided. Um, and we kind of have a, a bunch of these overall, you know, quotes uh, that you kind of pull from the raw data that we uh, published uh, on, on, on GitHub. Uh, I think it's like a final, final bit. So, you know, does your organization use its OSPO as a way to kind of do partnerships and business development? Um, you know, about a little over half, you know, say that they, you know, generally rely on their OSPO to kind of build partnerships with other organizations. And that's generally kind of a natural, I think for a mature open source program office, they're generally handling things like alliances, business development, sometimes to kind of further the goal um, of the organization. I do think it's kind of one of the, you know, good benefits uh, of what an OSPO could provide for an organization. Being at an event like, you know, potentially this, you know, building bridges, this is something uh, an OSPO could definitely um, you know, help with. So, um, what can, you know, <laughs> from my kind of point of view and, and, and kind of, you know, us, uh, you know, on this, uh, you know, uh, you know, folks involved here with this talk is, you know, it's still early days, I think, with the OSPO movement. Um, not, you know, a lot of companies generally may not even have what they call an OSPO, but it may be like, you know, one person or half a person kind of helping, you know, saying like, we need to do something to improve how we do development, how we do open source, how we, like, it's impossible to go open source something. How do we make this, you know, better? So, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of opportunity for this kind of practice to grow. And I think part of that is a talking about it, providing examples that people could follow templates, job descriptions, and just, you know, you basically have to you know, create this kind of, you know, uh, j you know, job, you know, just description, right? You know, like I said, CISOs didn't exist, you know, in, you know, until 95. And, you know, this is something that I, I see over time, um, you know, OSPOs will eventually kind of follow that same, uh, same pathway. Um, kind of, you know, other things like this, oh, go ahead, you got a comment? I was going to say, I think part of the supporting work that we do at LF Research and certainly at the new yep. stack is to provide the evidence and the data and the discussion that leads to better education among senior decision makers to provide the support, the resources, yeah. the um, uh, staffing count, and um, you know, help bridge that gap in understanding so that the OSPO can become more uh, pervasive in, in corporate structures. And, you know, it, it's a bit of a fascinating discussion in, in many ways because, like, you know, how do how does like a how does a job you know, uh, category get created, right? Like, you know, like developer relations that kind of didn't exist for a while and now it's everywhere, right? So, you know, but that's still not really well defined. There's not like a really well trodden career path. Like does DevRel live in marketing? Does DevRel live in engineering? It's, it's you know, it's this similar thing is kind of happening, you know, here where we're trying to like flesh this out, provide some guidance to the industry, write down best practices and kind of get everyone, you know, involved in collaborating, kind of building this, this, this career path. And the only thing I wanted to add yeah. is that even to attend a conference like this, we have a section on uh, events, which is convince my boss. <laughs> so maybe we need to convince our bosses as, as to why we need to um, yeah. rethink uh, the formation or the expansion of the OSPA. Yeah. So I want to leave time for questions. We definitely um, we're about five minutes away from frosty beverages, so maybe we have time for 
couple questions, um, you know, for folks from the audience. Uh, you know, I'd love to kind of, you know, get some feedback from folks. And if people want to kind of chat about, like, you know, after this talk about, like, how, how like, jo categories of jobs are, like, created in the industry, or, like, you know, how, like, things like DevRel, OSPOs, like, please pick my ear at it because I'm fascinated of how we could kind of do this, do this better. Go ahead. All right. It seems that uh, successful open source communities <clears throat> are microcosms of what it takes to have productive collaboration. And they manage their own education, governance, communications, and funding. Um, you all alluded to um, the education industries, government, telecom, and financial industries adopting OSPOs at the beginning of yep. the uh, presentation. I'm wondering, as that continues, um, how do you see the future of open source um, in society coming together. Um, that's concise enough. Yeah, I mean, I, I, uh, I don't even know how to like answer that outside. I think like, you know, it's kind of like how software was kind of very niche and like software now is like pervasive. It's literally like everywhere. It's in, you know, your phones, TVs, fridges, microwaves, and it just becomes a, a fabric of, of society. And so things like educational institutions, governments need to have policies, education. I just think it just becomes, you know, like you have the kids need to learn how to potentially program and how to collaborate, you know, with open source projects, how to work together. I, I just think it just becomes, you know, part of society, but like that's not a good answer. I think. I'll, so, I'll, yeah. I'll expand to say that um, the competitive landscape has required organizations like, um, I'll take academia. There's a lot of competition for online learning. And so if universities and colleges do not transform and, and fast track to digitization, they will um, potentially become profoundly disrupted. And COVID-19 has accelerated the path to digital uh, by approximately five years. So it's not really a surprise that some of these industries might feel that threat from fast digital transformation and need to rethink their digital strategy holistically and open source is a vital part of that. So I think that's what we're seeing on the whole is this rapid transformation to digital and governments, enterprises having to rethink old business models and how they create value for the communities, whether they're students, customers and others. And, and we're all digital now. So there has to be a digital strategy and open source has got to be part of that. Yeah. Yeah, and it's kind of interesting where you kind of see some of the stuff happening in like universities and governments at least kind of parallels what early, you know, why some of the early tech companies, you know, uh, favored open source and had OSPOs is like just simply, simply around like software procurement, right? You know, sometimes companies decided, you know, instead of me contracting like, and just basically having other people build everything that I need for, for my company, I want to bring that in, in house. It's, you know, kind of the examples like a Capital One, like a bank. It's like, they're like, well, we used to just contract, you know, outsource to have everyone else do it. but that's actually not helping us, you know, stay competitive. We need to bring that potentially in-house, you know, build, you know, build our own software teams. And I think you're seeing that happen in, in academia and government where they're like, maybe we just don't need to buy all this commercial stuff fed by very large companies. Maybe we need to do some of this, you know, in-house or maybe we could potentially find an, an open source, you know, uh, friendly option that will allow us to stay more competitive than maybe be tied to one specific vendor. Go ahead. I would just like to add that, you know, at the new stack, one of the things we do is we focus on at scale development, deployment and management. And we've been doing that since 2014. And that really kind of came on the heels of seeing uh, the rise of the of container infrastructure and how that basically did transform how we thought about scale, how it could be more packaged more easily. You know, since then, we've seen such a rise in open source. And over the past year has been such a sea change, you know, for us, I mean, for everyone in this room. And in that sea change, what we saw last year, like we couldn't, we had the hardest time actually getting a sample size for, uh, for the survey results. People were just kind of like, just trying to find their bearings. But when you come, I mean, one of the things that really has been, has struck me when I came, you know, here for the Open Source Summit is how much interest there was in, for instance, like, Sophia, your, your presentation on, on, on measurement, right, and how you measure your open source contributions. There's still so much we're needing to learn, not just about open source, but out, about scale itself. And that's starting to have a real big effect, effect on like how people think about rare diseases and how you treat them and how do you think about 
that market opportunity if the, if the big farmers aren't, you know, aren't really uh, addressing the problem. I'll take one last other question. Um, I was wondering, are you planning to do uh, a phase two survey where you do a deeper dive, um, particularly with uh, organizations that already have OSPOs? Um, I'd be so curious to find out. I mean, there's such a variety of yeah. how OSPOs are organized. Like, how large is your OSPO? Who does it sup uh, report to? Is it, you know, the head of engineering or is it legal compliance? And um, are your the members of your OSPO full-time devoted to the OSPO or are they part-time devoted? And, and those types of questions. So, you know, over the four years we've been doing this, we've kind of added some questions, I think, over time. I think, you know, uh, I think last year we, maybe, we may have added, like, where does your OSPO potentially report up to? Uh, I think this year we added how, how many potentially employees or, you know, full-time full -time folks are involved. So, like, some of that data is, is there, but, like, we rely on community input. Like, you know, I was going to say, like, you know, we do this every year. We kind of have a planning cycle, and we basically use GitHub. Like, if you want to open up an issue, modify a question, kind of work with us, and... Um, you know, uh, just please improve kind of this, you know, this, this research that we're kind of doing here. And the idea of about maybe like a targeted micro survey for like existing OSPOs is a great idea. Um, you know, maybe I'll talk to Hillary to see if we kind of do, you know, maybe, you know, I call it a micro survey, but we kind of see, you know, what we kind of do to kind of enable that. Because yeah, that, that is an interesting, um, you know, thing. And I look mm -hmm. forward to working with Hillary to enable that. All right, one, two more questions and then frosty beverages time. <laughs> I've been, yeah. when I've been talking to companies about OSPOs this year, it's actually been far more about security that has been the bigger driver than compliance or yeah. almost anything else. Did you happen to see, have any findings about security or comments? And if not, I think that'd be a great question to add, but just wondered if you had anything that spoke to that. Yeah, I'd have to go actually look at it up, up, up front. Yeah, it's kind of a, you know, the security thing has been a bit of an interesting issue with all the kind of issues in, that have happened recently in the U.S. cyber secure, security order that happened recently that kind of caused a spike in, you know, a severe interest everywhere around security. Historically, the results show that there's, there's a shift going on from more about compliance and being it yeah. a responsibility of the legal departments and more responsible responsibility of the engineering to, you know yeah. part of the organization and part of that is in terms of what the capabilities are of the tools now for instance scanning images you know as an example and so that has been turned over more to the developer teams and the engineering teams as a result because a lot of it's now becoming automated now obviously we're seeing a much deeper concern about the software supply chain here, and I expect there's, yeah. actually I was talking to someone the other day at the Linux Foundation, I said how many, you know, how many, um, op how many security um, related open source organizations are there in the LF? And they said basically twice as many as last year and, and, and like far more than, the, than two years before. So Everyone it's a good topic to Everyone explore. gets a security project. But, I mean, it's interesting, security generally, what's up? Who was the last person who had that question? I think I, it was in there. Did you? Who had their hand up? I think it was at the back. Okay. Do you mic? I think the thing with security, by the way, it's like it slows people down generally, right? It doesn't improve their efficiencies, which is hard to deal with. But let's look at your question and then we'll. So you had the different industries. Do yep. you um, ever pr publish it with just by industry the answers they get? Cause we, we haven't, but we, we have the data. It's like there's a raw CSV on, on GitHub, essentially, and you, we go do that analysis. I mean, I think one interesting thing is to kind of do some deep dive analysis of like, hey, maybe just like let's go target of how things are in the financial industry versus telco versus versus yeah. tech. And, and, it, and it's hard because what's, what's happening is like, you know, I don't know whether like the person that submits a survey from Capital One considers them a financial company or like a tech company now. It's like this weird thing that's happening too that I think kind of muddies uh, some of some of the results. But yeah, Capital we, yeah. One would say they're a tech company. <laughs> I don't like, no, they're a financial company, but. Uh, that's <laughs> I think it'd be a little more helpful for me to see related okay. companies and how they respond to yeah. these questions than having the big mix. Yeah, th th we'll, we'll take that. And I think the, the, I think the idea that, um, like at least the suggestion is uh, deep dive analysis um, is, is super useful for, for a lot of folks um, here. Yeah, and, and the we'll data sets being publicly available, that's something that we will continue so that you can t download the yeah. CSV file and play around with it and, and see what insights you can come up with and by all means share uh, findings yeah. back with us.
yeah, eventually maybe we'll kind of have some kind of like automated like notebook or something that we could share and people kind of play with on their own. Right now, you know, a raw CF CSV dump is not super uh, <laughs> useful, but it, it, you have something to get yourself started with. So. Cool. Oh, one more question and then Mike? let's break. So uh, I, I saw the initial um, yeah. like track of, of things, and it seems like, like there are a lot more people consuming open source software than contributing to it. Yep. Um, and so I'm wondering if, uh, like, what what is the benefit for the company to contribute to open source software? I mean, besides the obvious utilitarian, like you know, software needs to continue, so contribute to it. Like, is is there a, more of a substantial benefit? Yeah, I mean, there's some research that's kind of been published. You know, I think uh, you know, I on the Tudor Group we have. Uh, I think if you go to like GitHub or Tudor Group slash research, maybe we list kind of a bunch of, you know, uh, things in papers where like you know what benefits do people get from contributing, right? You know, there's some things around. Um, you know, you, you're able potentially to stay up to date with you know any security issues. You kind of have, um, you know, this this whole um, you know, if if you don't contribute to critical projects that you truly depend on in your business, you may lose the ability to steer them to benefit your business down the line. And there's been research done with like folks that have contributed to Linux kernel and how they've benefited from. But I think we have a, a list of kind of you know papers. But it's going to be different from you know for um, you know for everyone depending on what their uh, organization is. I mean, there is kind of this weird common you know good thing that sometimes happens for some some projects. But um, yeah, I think. Look at the research that we have highlighted and kind of take I, I can just add one yeah. thing. The results do show that the companies that just begin using open source and they begin thinking more about how open source plays in the organization, the more they use it, then you start to see them thinking about participating in projects. Yeah. And then the last step is where they actually they create a project to start contributions. Yeah. And there's been more of those. People that have OSPOs, definitely <clears throat> contribution is significantly higher to, to projects. Um, than 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 than, than, folk, than organizations that don't, for sure. All right, I think um, we're standing in between people and and, and beverages. And thank, thank you, you for thank you for us. coming here and.